some awesome God stories when I was out in Yellowstone. But I'm going to wait. You're going to have to wait because God is amazing. I will tell you this. Most of you know about the wildfires and everything, and I've been praying for really good weather. And uh, the one day we're at Yellowstone, we're taking all these amazing pictures. We're just like having this great day. We're not even thinking anything about it, you know. And uh, Marlene went into one of the gift shops and said something about how beautiful the weather was. And the lady's like, this is like the first day all summer that you can see the sun. She said, it's been just a haze of smoke. She's like, it's beautiful today. And we're like, yes, yes, God, it's so good. So I got a lot more stories. That was just a quick one, but um, of how God just showed up. And, and he doesn't want to just show up for me. He wants to show up for you, too. So just remember that. Well, today we're going to talk about church leadership but really, it's really about not only church leadership, it's about all of us in the body of Christ and who we are and what is our role in the church. And, and you know, when you have a family, we all have different parts, right? And the most classic place to kind of look at that is in, in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 4, where it says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. If I had somebody come up to me and said, I can take out both your eyes or I can take out your tongue, which one, you know, which one's more important? That'd be tough, right? I mean, you know, it'd be like, kind of like somebody saying, like, I'm going to take out your lungs, I'm going to take out your heart. Which one? You know, it's like, ah, uh, they're both equally important. <laughs> you know, like, I can't just pick one or the other. And that's his point, right? Like, the body of Christ has many different members, and sometimes the devil makes us believe, well, that part is more important than this part, just because it's more visible, right? But that doesn't mean it's not more important. If I had to pick between my heart or my tongue, what would I pick? I'd pick, keep my heart, go ahead and take my tongue. Even though the tongue is what you guys hear all the time. And you would think that's more important, but I could live without my tongue. But I couldn't live without my heart. So he explains it like this. He says, for just as each of us have one body with many members or parts, and these parts do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all of the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. Isn't that amazing that literally one part of the body is just the people that come to give? or the people that come to encourage, or the people that come to serve. It, if, if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So those are just a brief spot there. I mean, there's, there's other passages. I thankfully took them out because, again, I only have so much time. But you can go through your Bible. You can just Google you know, people always think, like, I'm the only one that can find it in the scripture. Nowadays, you got a phone in your hand. you got a little mini computer. Just go to Google, go to your search part, and write Bible gifts of the church, right? And you'll find all these scriptures will pop up. And, you know, I always say, use that to search to find the scriptures, then go to your Bible and read it. Because sometimes there are um, people that have different versions of Bibles that maybe don't believe in the, you know, Christian faith as way we do that can steer you in a different direction, but use that to find those scriptures, kind of read through and say, okay, hey, look here, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, or, you know, whatever, and find it in your Bible, and read through there, and highlight, because people will say, well, what is my gift, Mary? I'll be like, I don't know, I've got tests, why don't you make an appointment, come down to the church, I've had people do that before, and we'll go through, I remember one of the gals we're going to be talking about today is Miss Heather, and about a year ago, she started attending here. And at one point, she said, I like to do a gifts test to see where my gift is and how I can help and serve in the church. She got done, and I was like, I didn't say it that day, but I was like, oh, elder, Bible study teacher. Ooh, we're going to get her in the Sunday school with the kids right away. I was like, yes. And then I waited. I waited a year to see, is she living out what this test just showed me that she's gifted in? 
And, and thankfully, she's living it out. And that's why she's going to be one of the people I want to be acknowledging today. I love the word anointing and acknowledge, or acknowledging and anointing. See, I'm not identifying today. I identified years ago in these people what we're acknowledging today. I identified it when I saw them actually doing it, and then I waited to watch them do it. Now we're just acknowledging, hey, this person is an elder. She's been eldering. She's been eldering her family. She's been eldering this church. And now we're finally acknowledging it. We're going to anoint her and let all of you know that this person is an elder here in the church. Now, why do we need to do that? Why can't we just say, well, I just get to know the people around me, and some of them are great. I should just let anybody talk to me. I should let anybody pray to me. Well, because Jesus warned us not to do that. Let's look here. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Jesus said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, when you hear that there could be ferocious wolves in among the sheep, that can kind of sound scary, right? I mean, when you think about, like, the goal of a wolf in a sheep pen is to eat the sheep. Now, I always remind people, like, you know, think about the time and the culture and what was happening during that time. There was literally a time with the new Christians that there were people that were killing the other Christians. Thankfully, we live in a society and in a day where we don't have um, to worry about that in America. Now, there's countries where, like, like in China, where they're literally tearing down churches and arresting people. And in the, in the Middle East and Muslim countries where Christians are being killed. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen anymore. But in America, our culture's a little bit different. And I think about the domesticated dogs that came from wolves, right? When, when you take a, take a shepherd, you know, like you think of like a German shepherd or a, a border collie in Australia, one of these sheep dogs, and you put them in with the wolves, they're not trying to kill the wolf, but they're trying to control the wolves, you know? So sometimes when I think about our modern day Christianity, and, and what am I looking for as a pastor with the wolves? Am I looking for somebody that's going to come in and try to kill the sheep? No. But I am looking at people who maybe are trying to control others. See, control is not from God. God is love, right? And he doesn't want us to be fearful. That's the opposite of love. Perfect love casts out fear. But we do have people that will come in that, you know, I want to lead, I want to do this and that. And they want to control, right? They want to control the board. They want to control the pastor. They want to control the people. They want to, oh, I heard about this person's situation, and this is what you need to do. And I remember being a young, immature Christian and thinking that way, too. Like, I would try to control my husband. I would try to control my kids. I would try to control my best friend. And, oh, you should be doing this, and you should be doing that, right? And that's what a lot of times, you know, if you have a gift of leadership, but you're immature in that, you feel like, well, I'm right. They're wrong. Like, they've got to see it my way. I've got to tell it to them this way. I've got to tell it to them this way. I've got to call them again. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And so the biggest thing that I look for when I'm acknowledging and anointing leadership, is does this person want to control? Does this person want to just love? And that, my friends, in a lot of cases, that person is probably going to be a good leader, but they just have to get to a maturity level to re recognize and realize that my goal isn't to control everybody. And that's hard, you know, especially when you're a mom and you've got little kids. I remember, I remember when my one daughter was maybe 12, like, I, you know, when they're five, you can kind of control them, right? When they're three, you can kind of control them a little bit. Like, you can at least control who they're going to talk to, what they're going to see, what they're going to watch on TV, what they're going to eat that day. You know, you can try. But all of a sudden, they get to a certain age, and you realize, like, I lost control. I have no control. I've never had any control. This was a fallacy in my head. They were compliant. That's it. They were, they were compliant to me, and they're no longer compliant, and I have no control over this child or this person. And so when we as a church say, okay, we're acknowledging that these are the people that are the elders, 
we see something in them. And, and when I say elders, I also mean the pastors. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, about, you know, when the Bible talks about elders, go to the elders for prayer. Does that mean I don't go to the pastors? I go to the elders. But pastors function in an elder role. But most of the time, a pastor is a little more extroverted. They, they also have the gift of teaching. They also have the gift of exhortation. And so we, we, in our modern day church, we call them the pastors, and we know that they're the ones that are going to probably get up and teach, and they're going to lead a certain area, but they can function as an elder does as well. The elders are typically, th this is their area. We're not going to necessarily put them in charge of, not that they couldn't, I know a few elders here that I would probably have no problem calling up, hey, I'm puking, can you preach tomorrow, right? They might not like want to do that every week, but they could do it, you know? But uh, so we're going to talk about the elders and the pastors. And the, so the ones that we're going to be acknowledging today are ones that we've prayed about, we've seen in their life. Uh, soon to be here, Pastor Sarah, that we're going to be acknowledging. You know, I've known her for five or six years now. And what's been really interesting has been her consistency when we've called her to even just help with Dream Center stuff. You know, most of you might be like, well, I haven't seen her here week after week for the last year like I have seen Heather here. But she's been a part of this ministry here for the last three years since the day we opened and, and helping us with different things. And I know her personally and have seen her ministry work and seen those things that she does. And again, I'm not putting a new mantle on her. I'm acknowledging the mantle God put on her because that's something that God has put on these people that we're acknowledging today. So, you know, we've prayed about it. We've, now, are we always 100% accurate? Absolutely not. But that's why we've learned over these years to just be patient on God and to wait on God and to pray. And there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors because Jesus does warn us that there could be wolves that come in. And so I look to see, like, is this person, you know, trying to be controlling? Is this person's fruit? Well, what is this person's fruit in their life, right? Who are the people that they're affecting in their lives? It does not mean they're perfect. Because if, if, if one of the criteria was you have to be perfect to be a leader in this church, uh, there would be no church. <laughs> because not one of us is without sin. Not one of us is perfect. But is our heart here to serve God's people? Absolutely. And that's why we come back week after week. So we also see here in the book of Acts, where he talks about this, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul was talking to the church as he was kind of going. He's moving on to the next place. But he says... Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, I love this because the elders, the pastors, the board of directors, we're get to, we've been entrusted with overseeing how this body, how this, this community is, is served through this. And he says that's from the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has bought with his own blood. But then he gives them some advice. So I wanted to read this today for us to keep in mind. He says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you, night or day, with my tears. He goes on. Now I commit to you, God, to you, God, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my command, companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus himself. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I liked that part of Paul's passage because most of you know, I don't take a paycheck. Most of us that are here, the ones that we are able to give a little bit to, to be able to do this work, they're not making what they would be making if they had the same responsibility and role like at Dow Chemical, right? Because we're not doing this to get somebody's money. On the contrary, we're taking a lot of money that comes in the budget and we're stretching it and making sure that we have diapers, that we have the toilet paper, that we have the soap, that we have the items that people need. And so I loved how Paul reminded him, look, I didn't come here looking for your gold or for your silver. I came here to help and to serve the weak. Um, I think it's verse, what, 34? 
and how he supplied his own needs. In 35, it says, In everything I did, I showed you that this is the kind of hard work we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So that's really a reminder for all of us that are part of this flock, that are part of this leadership, that are shepherds. We do this hard work because we're helping the weak. We're not doing this to stand among the strong and the wealthy and say, look at me, and I'm on this big platform. We are literally coming here week after week to help this community. And, you know, we meet on Sunday to be encouraged to hear the word, but what I really need to know from all of you is, okay, how do we help the community? What is some new need? You know, I need you to come in here and say, hey, Pastor Mary, you know, all the guys at work in this area, they've been talking about this area and how the school needs help with this, and be like, yeah, let, let's do something, right? Let's get some people together, and let's go down to the school system and, you know, pay off their lunch bill, or let's, you know, what, what's going on? Like, where do we need to help out? You know, I remember when we started putting the coats and the blankets out front out here, one of the big things that I was told was the elementary school, which is literally like three or four blocks behind us, a lot of those kids, they can't go outside at wintertime to recess. Why? They don't have hats. They don't have gloves. They don't have snow pants. They don't have boots. Here I am putting it out on the sidewalk, and what I need to be doing is doing a separate drive just for children's snow pants, hats, gloves, boots, and then every winter we need to be going down into those classrooms and making sure all those kids get it. Why don't we do that, Pastor Mary? That's a great idea. Well, I am one person, and I have only so many hours per day. I need the flock, the congregation. I need somebody to raise their hand and say, I'll be in charge of that, because I can blast it all over Facebook. I can send it to our email list. I can get you the stuff, but I can't be the one responsible. In the beginning, I did everything, and we're, we're stopped right here at this point where we're at, because like, I cannot start any more new programs, but you can right? We've got, we had money given to us for car seats. Have you seen on Facebook when we're giving away the car seats? No, I don't have anybody to, to be here once a month to unlock the doors and say, here are the car seats. So that's part of the flock stepping up. Now, you might not be a shepherd, you might not be one of the elders, but you can be in charge of the car seat ministry. You can be in charge of the snow pants ministry, right? And it literally just takes all of us picking up different areas to do that. And I recognize that I need to speak up more and remind people of that, right? Because I wish I could do it all myself. I wish that I had that ability, but unfortunately, I don't. You know, one of the big things that I've asked the Lord about is like, what is my call? Because for the last three years, I came in as the preacher, and I've now been, you know, directing over all the different ministries that we do. And I obviously quickly realized I couldn't, so we were able to bring Marlene on, which we're so very thankful for as the operations manager, but literally everything that I was doing that I asked her to do, it's the job of two full-time people. <laughs> so she's able to do about half of it well, right? And the other half, not as well, because it's like, oh yeah, I guess I was putting in more than 40 hours a week, right? It feels good not to have to put all that in right now. And so, you know, we're, we're looking, we're saying like, okay, can we get volunteers that are willing to come in once or twice so we can answer the phones and get the deliveries ready and you know, to take care of the little things so then we can say, okay, now she's got this time and this freedom to go to in these things. So I don't do everything in this church. I don't at all. We have elders. We have pastors. We also have our overseers, which is the board. And then we also have the sheep. And, and they're, they're in the sheep. We have deacons and, and all these different areas, musicians and Sunday school teachers and department heads and so I'm going to um, be asking the elders to come up. So I'm going to have a couple of people, go, our helpers, to go grab some of the elders that are volunteering right now. And I'm going to ask Heather and her family that would like to join her. You don't have to if you don't want to. If just her husband wants to come up, that's fine. I see all the teenagers giving her that sly look. But I think that, you know, it's, you guys are part of her life, and she loves you. You know she does. So... Come on down. The price is right. I promise I won't do anything to you that you don't like. I will keep my oily hands just on Heather and Jason. So here we have some elders. Um, this is Heather and Jason and their beautiful family. And we're so very thankful for all their help. Like I said, Heather and Jason, they've been attending for about a year now. Um, they were married here in this beautiful church, in this congregation. 
and they have helped in so many different ways. I could sit here, but I only have like five minutes to do about 20 minutes worth of work, so I'm not going to go into all the details, but we are very blessed to have them here, and so we also have an elder team. Come on up, Ashley. So we have Ashley is one of our elders, Marlene, Eric, and Jesse. And what we're doing today is anointing Heather to join our elder team. Now we see in James chapter 5, a lot of people say, well, what do I go to the elders for? In James chapter 5, verse 14, we see here where it says that, um, it says, is any among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, that's just one scripture. There, like I said, there's a lot of different scriptures that talk about um, the elders and all the different areas and overseers. I'm going to be reading a few more of those passages. But the biggest thing that heart that I'm looking for in an elder is do they have an attitude of prayer? And Heather definitely has an attitude of prayer and, um, and, and a desire to, to love the Lord. So we're going to be praying over Heather. So Heather, come on right here in the middle. Jason, come on over. And you guys can get a little closer if you want, or not. And I'm going to be praying over you, Heather. All right. Father God, I just thank you so much for this family. I thank you for their love for you. I thank you that you have just revealed to us the gifts in Heather in her heart for your people and for those around her and for her desire to pray over them and to know what your scripture says and to be willing to serve and to have a heart that cares for this community and we thank you father god we know that she is not perfect and that she continues to mature and to grow every single day and we ask you to guide her and just to love her as she spends time in your presence. And we just thank you for her ability to love your people. And we just thank you for her gifts and talents to this church. And we anoint her as an elder of the Great Lakes Dream Center. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, you guys can go sit down. And Jason, you too. But Heather, you get to join the elders over here. <laughs> Woohoo! And I do have a certificate for you. You can pass that on down. It just acknowledges that she's an elder here at the church, and they encourage. So, you know, all right, let's say you really just want to talk to me. Great, come talk to me. Let's say you talk to me, and you're like, Shh, she don't know what she's talking about. Maybe I don't. Maybe I have no clue as to your situation because I have nothing in common with your situation. But maybe Eric here knows exactly what you're going through. Right? Maybe Heather over there knows exactly what you're going through. Maybe you really need to just get a hold of Jesse. You know, we are a body, right? Like, I don't mess around with my eye when I'm having a problem with my toe, right? I, I get out the tweezers and I deal with my toe. So, you know, God has anointed me to lead and to preach, but in many cases, I'm not always the one that you need to talk to. So don't get discouraged if the first time you talk to somebody, it's like, yeah, why, what was the point of going to church leadership? They didn't help me. There's more than one of us. So here are some of the elders here. So definitely um, check them out and talk to them as well. Now, the pastors, again, have the same anointing, I believe, as elders and go to them for prayer. But we also see that they have also been gifted with the ability to teach. Now, this scripture is not as fun. And uh, hopefully I don't scare anybody off here. I think I know... Uh, I think I know Sarah and Nicole well enough to know that they're going to be like, uh-huh, yeah, I know that one because I've read that one before. But in James 3, verse 1, it says, Not many of you should become teachers. Many, my fellow believers, because you know that if you teach, you will be judged more strictly. So, with that being said, I'm going to call up... <laughs> Our elders who also have this great ability to teach and to lead. And so right now we have Pastor Nicole. She is one of our pastors here. And obviously you've heard her teach. And, and uh, you know, she takes it very seriously when she's preaching. You know, she'll be like, you know, weeks before, like, oh, I've been studying this. I've been doing this. Like, I've been... why? Because she takes it seriously. The Bible says you should just be doing that just for willy-nilly, right? You're going to be judged. And so she wants to know, what does the scripture say? What does this mean? And, you know, Pastor Sarah here, she has been teaching young ones for how many years? Probably like Nicole, like 20, 30. 30 years, yeah. So, you know, a lot of times people say like, well, I've been teaching children. It's not the same as teaching adults. Oh, no, 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 no. 
children will call you out right in the middle of your sermon and be like, hey, hey, are you sure? Are you sure about that? Like, so for 30 some years, she's been teaching and praying over children. And um, if many of you may, may or may not have known, but she is now, after today, after we anoint her, our new children's pastor. And she's going to continue teaching not only the children, but at times the adults as well. And she's done a lot of ministry through Celebrate Recovery in many different areas um, where she's shared her testimony and shared God's word. She just led a retreat at her house with a a lot of women to pray with them for um, just refreshing and recovering and healing. And again, we're acknowledging what she's already doing. So Sarah, would you please come on over and bring some of your family down? I see some of them here. I know, ladies, come on. (laughs) She's not here by herself. All right. All right, elders, continue to uphold Sarah here in prayer. All right, get them all over. Yeah, Pastor Nicole, why don't you come over here at Cider? We'll have. And um, I am just super excited that you're here today. And I'm super excited that, you know, as we continue to minister to the community, we've, we've put the calls out, come help us, come help us serve. And you have been one that has responded to that call, and I know that, Um, as we anoint you, that just a supernatural mantle of God's presence is just going to be upon your life. It already is, but we can always use a little extra, right? So let us pray for Sarah. Father God, we thank you for Sarah. We ask you to bless her and all that she does. We ask you to watch over her and be with her. Thank you, Father, for her life. I thank you for the call upon her life. I thank you that she's answered that call. I thank you for her ability to minister to children and the gifting that you put on her and to to worship and to lead those in in many different areas of life. And I ask you to be with her and watch over her. May your angels go before her. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And I do have a certificate for you as well. A little smile for the camera there. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Okay, so... Isn't that wonderful? All right. Pastor Nicole, you're going to stay. We're going to have all the pastors in your family. Thank you so much. You go ahead and have a seat. All right. So I need you guys to line up and look at me for a minute. I know. I didn't tell you about this part. Yeah, but that's okay. You, you'll, you'll be fine. All right. So I have a charge to all of the pastors and all of the elders of this church. All right. So I just want to do this for all of you. Number one, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, right? When you are weak, let him be strong, right? When you're not doing good, let his joy of the Lord be your strength, right? Love the Lord, number one. Number two, love his word. This is the answer. It's always the answer. We might need some understanding of, well, what where, where part do I need to go to and who is he talking to in that moment, but... Go to his word. Love his word. Let his word be more important to you than, his, than food, right? Jesus said, man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word out of the mouth of God. So as we serve this people in this community, love his word. And number three, love his people. Turn around and just look who's here today. See who's here today? This is his people. Love them. When they make you really, really angry, Love them. When they offend you and they call you up and say, Pastor Mary doesn't know what she's talking about, love them. Love them, love them, love them. When your neighbor who lives next to you makes you mad, love them. All right, come turn back and look at me. Now I'm going to pray over all of you. Now you, the sheep are next, so just, you just wait. Don't think I'm ignoring you there. All right. Father God, In your word, it says that you have set apart some people for the tasks of being overseers, elders, and pastors. We thank you for this privilege that we have today to see this happening in our church and the special opportunity we have to affirm the calling of these elders and pastors' lives. It is so clear to us that you have gifted them for this purpose. We eagerly anticipate all the ways that you will use them to further your kingdom. I ask now, Father, that you will be with them in all the years to come. Give them the wisdom they need, the patience they need, the love they will need to serve as pastors and elders. And I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for your service.
All right, you may be seated. Thank you. All right. First Peter 5. Oh, Ashley, wait a second. You got to hear this. First Peter chapter 5. Wait a minute. It's 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4 says, The elders among you, I appeal to you as a fellow elder and as a witness of God's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not loitering or over those who have been entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. All right. Well, I'm super excited for all of them. Now, one thing we also have here in America, right, is we have our legal requirements. So we do have a board of directors, and I believe that, you know, this Bible talked about overseers, that our board is also functions as an overseer. Thank you, Ashley. And I know you have to go back down for Sunday school. I just wanted you to hear that. First Peter. I'll, I'll text everybody that passage. I love that in First Peter chapter 5. And um, we have a board of directors. So our board of directors, and I'm just going to have you all stand. Let's just have them stand real quick. Um, so I'm going to just point them out to you here. Roland, you're going to have to come stand inside here so they can see you. So our board of directors is our legal oversight of the church. So we have Marlene. When I say your name, you can wave. We have Roland. We have Jim, who's the president of our board. We have Jesse, who's the secretary. And we have Stephanie. Stephanie is from Kalkaska, so, and Jim is actually from the Sanford area. So what we've tried to do, and you guys can have a seat, just so everybody understands our um, we try to have about 50% of our board be from inside Bay County and 50% of our board be outside of Bay County. And then that way they give us a different perspective. Maybe they're doing something different in their community. Maybe um, they're able to attend on a regular basis. Maybe they're attending their churches on a regular basis. But, so the legal entity, the, our director of the board that we register with the state of Michigan, um, which we also hold to our biblical standards. We want them to be Christians. We want them to understand that they're not doing this for financial gain, that they need to be diligent in this, is because they're overseeing the church finances, so they, they approve the budget every year. And they're also the legal oversight over me. So yes, go to the elders if you're upset about something, but let's say there was uh, something going on that we had a pastor at the point where we needed to remove them from their position of leadership, we could go to the board and then they could legally make that decision and say this person is no longer affiliated with our church. So we need directors of the board as well. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says in verse 1, it says, here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. So there's nothing wrong with desiring to be in church leadership somewhere, right? Now, you have to understand that you're going to be, you know, watched for a year or so to see, like, what fruit does this person have? What's their true desire of their heart? And then you're going to um, have all these different things, you know, that we're going to kind of pray about and kind of wait on the Lord to see. So it says that if you desire to be an overseer in the church, that's a noble task. But then it also says in verse 13, it says, those who serve well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So when you do serve and you do serve well, God sees that. We see that. We're very thankful for that. But it also says in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4, I like this one. It says, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. So that's a verse that I wanted to remind the board of directors as they look over the finances that sometimes, you know, that hard work that we do, that's what brings that wealth. And so, you know, if you are a leader, don't be surprised to be asked to help, right? To, to oh boy, what now? Oh, it's Pastor Mary calling me. Now, you know, what does she want me to do now? And what she, well, because we're not going to be lazy, right? Because that's going to bring about poverty. We're going we're gonna to be diligent. We're going to be working hard. We're going to start some new programs. We're going to ask more people to help. 
And with all of that, we're going to be able to do so much. So I'm going to pray for all. And so the passage I wanted to share with all of you as shepherds, and I don't think I gave this scripture. Oh, I did. In Matthew, right? Matthew chapter 25. So we have these overseers, but then we also have the sheep, right? And it's like, well, boy, if, if, the, if the overseers are doing all this stuff, what am I going to do? I'm just going to come on Sunday, and I'm going to leave, right? Well, you could, but... I'm going to read to you what Jesus said. <laughs> so in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. I guess the big question today is, are you a sheep or are you a goat? Hmm. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous, right, the sheep, will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, or give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. See, the role of the sheep, I would say, is even more important than the role of the shepherd. The sheep are there, and they multiply each other, right? A shepherd just comes in, and he kind of, oh, here the water's over here. This is where the food is. But the sheep, they're loving on each other. They're taking care of each other. They're the ones growing the wool. They're the ones that's, that's producing something. So today we were able to anoint and acknowledge the leaders that we have in this church. But ultimately, I'm going to stand before God like everybody else as a sheep to say, what have I done with my life? Right? Yes, maybe I had a moment here where I was leading, but the rest of the time, did I help the one that was poor? Right? Did I help the one that needed clothing? Did I help the one that needed food? Did I help and visit? Did I do these things? It doesn't say that the shepherds will all be gathered and asked if they did these things. It says the sheep will. So we need to walk out of here knowing that there are different gifts. Is my gift to encourage? Is my gift to give? Is my gift to serve? How is my function as part of this body and as part of a sheep in this place? And so I want to pray now over everyone, because we are all sheep. Father God, we thank you for loving us and making us a part of your flock and being the great shepherd. May your voice be the voice we follow. Speak to us this week. Whisper in our ear. May your voice be the lo loudest voice in our head. Show us, Father God, who to help, how, where to give, what to do, to be able to say that when we help the least of these, we are helping you, Jesus. Be with us and watch over us as we live this life under your guidance and under your care. Help us to be a functional part of a body of Christ, a part of a family, that we have our role, that we have our gift. Reveal it to us and show us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to all be blessed. May the Lord shine upon you this week. Um, if you get a chance to say congratulations to Heather or Sarah, definitely say congratulations to them. We're super excited to have them part of this body. And the Blessing Shop is open, and we will see you all next Sunday at 10 o'clock. God bless. Thank you.